I'll just introduce myself. My name's Terry Bobois in real life, Tab Scott in Second Life, and um, I'm, I'm a real life architect. Um, yeah, that's a good suggestion, Mike. A full day uh, field trip when when Phil's ready. Uh, there's other little places that we can visit too uh, throughout uh, Second Life. There's a lot of work that's been done in reg in regards to NASA and rockets and space travel and things like that. So uh, Science Circle is a good place to sort of amalgamate all of that together for people to begin to get a sense of um, the the current moon project, which is absolutely going to take you know decades to complete. It's not going to be over in a, in a short period of time. And one of the things that I want to mention um, that I think is so interesting about the program, NASA is being so careful. They have people's lives at stake here, and they're taking it seriously, and as they always have uh, and always did. But um, part of my interest in doing this presentation is the fact that I find the topic so interesting myself. And I'll um, start. Now, one of the things that I'm comparing and contrasting is designing for Earth and designing for the moon. Because I've designed for Earth, and I am, uh, I'm not working full time with NASA, but I keep in touch with them. Um, I live near. Uh, NASA Ames Research Center in Mountain View, California. I'm in Palo Alto. And the um, I, I just visited Ames this month and visited their regolith um, uh, area that they're building because they're testing out moon. Um, <laughs> we're very designing, yeah. Um, the they're testing out uh, different kinds of vehicles because the regolith on the moon is so different from what the surface of the Earth is like. And what I'm showing here on this screen is this is a, the, the, the building on the left is a building I designed up in Montana. And it's, it was taken, the picture was taken a couple months ago in the snow. And uh, it's in contrast to, you know, I could show a picture of it in sunlight with the mountains behind it and looking beautiful and stuff. And we all love living on Earth. Yeah, and burr to both photos, right? I, I just want everyone to think in terms of all the different places on Earth that we have to design for special conditions, whether it's Arctic or whether it's um, extremely tropical or whether it is, uh, I mean, even underwater in some cases for laboratories. Um, and so what I want to do is just sort of look at how, even on Earth, we have to take some pretty extreme uh, conditions uh, into consideration. Um, and, uh, and, and so when we think of the moon as being this sort of desolate um, uh, area, um, we're really using a lot of the information that we have learned for thousands of years of building on Earth when we transport ourselves to the moon and build there. And we're going to be learning things from the moon. And that's one of the most exciting things for me and why I'm involved in this. We're, and we're going to be, I'm going to be showing some of those things um, today. So the other thing I want to mention is I write for Architect Magazine and Green Builder Magazine. And uh, NASA has a, a publication called Tech Briefs. If you wanted to keep up with what NASA is doing, they do a good job. Um, and I did a study of Tech Briefs in the 80s and took all of the information in the Tech Briefs that applied to architecture and created a publication for architects on a technology that NASA is, um, um, yeah, 40. I've been in 40 degree below in, in Montana. I lived up there for. Um, uh, 10 years, and it is cold, but it's not 250 below. Oh, you were in Great Falls. Okay, well, you've, you've been in the, in the, in the uh, mountainous cold as well then. So um, we'll keep in touch with, you know, I'm going to be publishing 
I write an article every other month for Green Builder, and I'll probably figure out a way to meld the green building uh, topics that I write about with the moon base uh, uh, information that we're developing. So here's something that really changed my life in architecture. I went to an international medical health care meeting, and I was the only architect there, and all the doctors and the health care pro professionals, you know, that run hospitals and things were talking about health care. And I said, I'm an architect. What can I do to be most helpful to the health care system? And they said, if you can improve the safety and the health in buildings in a country, reduce doctor visits and hospital visits, that would be the best health care system that any nation could have. And that really transformed me into, into seeing how important in my role as an architect and everybody's role in, in creating buildings is in regard to keeping people safe and healthy while they're living and working in, you know, aesthetically pleasing buildings. That's what architects are supposed to be creating as well. And now this applies to, on Earth, and also it applies to the moon. And so the buildings that we're going to be looking at in, I want you to think in terms of the astronauts are getting the same care and attention that we should have living on Earth in the environments that are designed and built for us here. And a lot of work has been done. A lot of planning has been done already. And um, a thought has been given to this. And they're not moving at a rapid pace. They're, they're really taking their time. They're doing research. They're going to be very careful with the, the programs that they have. And I'll go over that a little bit. But the main thing we want to know is there's a lot of information already. There's a, it's just a question of applying it to certain circumstances. And, you know, here we see, you know, um, somebody can move around Earth dressed a certain way, but on the moon they're going to have to dress a certain way. And we're going to touch on uh, some of the reasons for that um, uh, today. And just, just so you know this, these two images were done in mid-journey. And I just typed in male astronaut uh, in, in uh, you know, normal clothing and in an astronaut suit and female astronaut in uh, um, normal clothing and an astronaut suit. And mid-journey pr produced these two images for us today. Now, the Moon Program has missions, and they have schedules, and they're planning on doing things. One of the things I'll just briefly bring is up, there's six missions have landed humans on the Moon beginning in back in 1969 when Apollo 11 and Neil Armstrong became the first person to walk on the moon. Um, and all nine crewed missions that we have sent to the moon have returned safely to Earth. And that's a real important statement because we know how it, space is a dangerous um, uh, situation. We have lost some astronauts in an explosion that we all probably remember if we were um, age to be following th th those current events at that time. And then, as of now, the Apollo 17 crew, crew has had the longest stay on, on the moon, and that's only 75 hours, or about three days. And so they're looking at how to create an, uh, a situation where um, uh, uh, the um, people can stay on the moon for longer periods of time. And that's one of the things that we'll be looking at and talking about today. Now, they just announced the, um, the crew for Artemis um, II, and you may have seen them on television, and they're getting a lot of press, and they're going around and, and doing a lot of presentations, and it's, it's fun to see them. And NASA has their own channel, at least on the cable system I'm on, NASA has its own channel, and I get to watch a lot of NASA things um, going on. Yeah, Apollo lost three astronauts. And, and so these are the astronauts. Now, these astronauts are going to go up, they're going to go around the moon, and they're going to come back. These astronauts will not land on the moon and walk on the moon's surface. That won't happen until Artemis 3, which is going to be in 2025. 
So we're two years away. And, and one of the things you'll notice is in a lot of NASA announcements, they do this clever thing. They'll say, this will not happen before 2024. So you may use this in your own work if you find that setting deadlines uh, puts you in, the, in a box that you don't want to be on. It's very U.S. government now to say this will not happen before a certain time when they're talking about schedules. Um, so you can see that Artemis II will be no earlier than 2024. Um, they'll take a 21-day trip. Now, Artemis III is where they're going to land two of the four astronauts that they send up there on the surface of the moon, and they're going to be there about six and a half days. And they're, they're not going to build anything on that visit. Um, they're going to be in a rocket that lands, and they're going to work out of that rocket, and I'll show you uh, an image of that in a little bit. It's not going to be until 2028 that um, astronauts are going to um, spend more time on the moon and do additional research and perhaps start building something. One of the things I want to mention is don't imagine this project being absolutely fixed with definite guaranteed deadlines and definite guaranteed scope of work that they're going to do in each project. Because we just had a situation that will come um, uh, – they're not planning on going on the far side of the moon in, in any of the visits that are planned so far that I know of. But the Chinese – our uh, space program has done some work over there. I think the Russian space program may do some – work over there, and that's another thing I'll talk about. There are a lot of nations involved in um, this research in addition to the United States, and um, NASA's obviously uh, a major player in all this, but it isn't exclusively just the United States. Um, I'll, let me check on my own facts here as far as uh, Brioni, whether they're going to make several orbits of the moon. I think they are. But I'll check on that detail. Um, and they just announced last week that while the plans have been up until last week to have the, a, a, a U.S. moon base or a NASA moon base near the South Pole, they're now considering having multiple moon bases. And they're working with their uh, Japanese and um, European neighbors and space programs on where those might be. So I as, as recent as last week, they've changed the program to include more moon bases than just the one, whereas when I started working on this presentation, there was only going to be one moon base. It was going to be at the South Pole, and it was starting to look focused and like we were going to know what area it was going to be in and things like that. So I think we should just allow NASA and the, the different uh, countries' space programs to evolve their plans, let's call it. It's not changing their mind. They're finding out new information all the time. And the, the, NASA, the, the NASA decision is actually a little political, too, because they want to be more inclusive and not have the only moon base on the moon. And if ESA wants to do one that, that, that's near the equator, that's going to be fine. They'll actually learn more science and learn more things um, um, as they have different locations. So by 2028, um, now I'm going to mention the gateway. This is a surprise to some people. Not everybody knows that there is also plans, in addition to landing people on the moon, they're going to build a modular space station that will be circling the moon and some, uh, in some cases, the astronauts will be going from Earth to that space station, um, getting accommodations there, f and then transferring to a separate vehicle that will take them to the surface of the moon. And those plans are changing as to who's got the contract to make the moon lander and things like that. So it'll be really fun to keep up with all of the changes and ideas that they have. Now, this is a way that NASA puts the information together. I, I don't find it perfect, but it on the, in the bottom left-hand side, you can see that it's 2020. In the bottom right-hand side, you can see it's 2024. So 
that's not one vehicle making a swoop across the sky there. They're trying to show different years and different programs and to get from where they are today to get to 2024, where you have Artemis III in the right-hand side of that image. Um, uh, and it's still being worked out when the gateway is going to be built and when astronauts will go to the gateway space station before they land on the moon and how often and what astronauts will be sent directly to the moon surface in a rocket. Um, and so I think you can expect to hear some further development along those lines. Yeah, even that's a good point, um, Roy. Even when you're in the sunlight side of the moon, there are rims and craters that, because of the atmosphere or the lack of atmosphere on the moon, the, cr the, the things that are in the shadow are very, very cold and very, very dark. In fact, the, the astronauts will have to wear special uh, gear, either light up the dark areas, or they won't be able to actually see anything in the dark areas. It's that dark. But that's even on the sunny side. That can be true as far as shade and light. Yeah, and, and near the South, South Pole, um, the areas there get a lot of um, um, uh, sunlight. Now, this is what the first moon landing is going to look like. This is a rocket ship that has been developed, and it will go from Earth to the moon. There is some discussion as to whether it's going to stop at the Gateway Space Station. It depends on whether it's there or not. I don't think that it'll be there in time. So I think this rocket may take the astronauts um, to the surface of the moon. There will only be two astronauts that go to the surface of the moon uh, when that is is planned. Yes, it's it's a um, modification of SpaceX's. This is a SpaceX product, and um, it's if you look really carefully in this picture, you can see the little tiny people on the gr on the ground on the moon walking around, and then you can see how large that spaceship is. But for this visit that we're looking at here, the astronauts will live and work out of that space vehicle. They will not build a house or any kind of a dome structure or anything. And what they'll do, these will be the first time that people are back on the moon, and there'll be two of them, and they'll be walking around taking pictures and taking videos that NASA plans to broadcast. Some of them are going to broadcast live. Um, It'll be really interesting for us all to be able to see this when it is happening. Um, but as you can see from the the, the um, title, this is planned for 2025. It'll be the first return of humans to the lunar surface in more than 50 years, and it will Ar Artemis 4, which is is not scheduled to uh, be launched until 2028. So you can see they're taking three years between the visit that is being depicted in this scene and the next visit to the moon. So they're going to really learn a lot, take that knowledge, and really figure out what they're going to do next. They're not rushing this. They're really taking their time, and they have to be careful, as we all know. So this is just a brief... Um, description of what I sort of just described already. I'm going to just sort of keep rolling through some of these slides. We've got a lot of ground to cover. And this is, again, just reinforcing that plans are going to change as things evolve and advance. And this is just reinforcing the fact that Jim Cree, um, uh, just last week, it was on Monday, April uh, 17th, that they announced that they're going to build several bases on the moon instead of a single Artemis base camp at the lunar uh, south pole only, as what they've been talking about since 2020. So I think we can expect that plans are going to change. So don't be surprised if even I have said something incorrect today that will be corrected tomorrow because the plans are changing that much and that rapidly. 
And the good news is that it will involve the European Space Agency, Canada, Japan, and all who have signed on to the Artemis program and series, uh, establish a series of moon camps across the, uh, the surface. And so they may have two or three sites to go to. They may even have more than that. Um, and so more science. And, and that's one of the things when Science Circle um, uh, started this project, one of the things we said is we're going to science the heck out of this thing. And so it's really going to be a fun, interesting um, uh, journey for all of us as we keep track of this as we're going along. Now, just to show you what the Gateway concept is, this is the space station that they plan to build that will be going around the moon, and um, it will be made up of different parts and pieces from the different space agencies, as you can see the labels on here. And you can see that it's going to be modular, so it's going to be built over a period of time. It'll be just the tiny uh, first one or two modules, and then they'll be sending up other modules as it as it grows. So it'll be it'll be uh, built and grow like the space station that we have circuiting the um, circling the Earth at this point in time. And um, we'll not, we'll learn more about this because sometimes the astronauts will go here before they go to the surface of the moon. And the the so if something gets held up on the s the the space station it may hold up NASA's plans on as far as reaching the surface of the moon in the future. Um, now, when you design something on Earth compared to what it is on the moon, here are the following factors that are different. Um, architect always has to design and meet the spatial and functional requirements of whatever they're designing. If it's someone's house, they have to know how many people in the family, what size rooms, you know, what kind of sports equipments they need to store, what kind of, you know, you just really collect a lot of information. The same exact principle will happen to anything we're doing on the moon. And you can see from the space station, they have different modules that hold different functions. Like this is where they're going to prepare food. This is where they're going to sleep. And so the same principles of designing for the Earth apply to designing for the moon's surface except some things are different. Gravity, wind, and water are present <laughs> on Earth. And the moon's gravity is one-sixth of the Earth's gravity. And so that'll come into play. I'll talk about that a little bit more. The other thing I thought about, and this just, this I hadn't seen anything about this. Um, one of the things, because I live in the San Francisco Bay Area, and then even in Montana when I lived up there, I was in a zone four earthquake zone. There are earthquakes on Earth, and that's why they're called earthquakes. The moonquakes also exist, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but I was surprised to see this is going to be a design factor um, for anything that we put up on the moon. Now, thermal comfort, we're going to talk about that. The moon's temperatures are ridiculously uh, uh, varied compared to what we experience here on Earth. One is hum Another factor is humidity, and I'll talk about human comfort and what it's based on. Um, air quality is really important. Um, as you know, all of the air will be supplied artificially um, to the astronauts, but it, it's something that we're taking a lot more seriously in uh, Earth design as well. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. Now, this was a big surprise to me. I'll talk about this later. I'm not, I'm not going to jump ahead, but we're going to talk a little bit about where's the energy uh, and the power source is going to be when we get to the moon. Um, and I just learned that Nokia is planning to launch a 4G internet for the moon later this year. They've jumped ahead and decided they want to be the internet company for moon communications. And that's interesting. Um, I've talked to Apple. Apple has a special satellite system that they've put up for the iPhone 14 and beyond so that if, if you're out of typical internet reach, like if you're in Yosemite or Yellowstone or out in the middle of nowhere where you don't normally have internet connection, app, if you have an Apple 14 or, or um, uh, iPhone, you'll be able to reach a satellite and, and, and they can identify your location and help uh, and send uh, aid or help if, if that is needed. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, 
Um, sourcing materials. One of the things, you know, I just finished a project th that I showed you that had snow on it in Montana. And you have to know where you're going to get all the stuff that you're designing into the building. And the same thing's going to happen on the moon. And this is really exciting. They're looking at now, a lot of the studies that they're doing on the moon currently have to do with, can we make it on the moon? Like, what can we make on the moon? Because it is so expensive. It costs millions of dollars to shoot something from the surface of the Earth, depending on how big it is and how much it weighs, and then get it to the surface of the moon. That using local materials, they're doing lots of research as far as what they can do. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then human sustainability is, is job one, the safety and health of the people. Um, and, and, and that's, as I mentioned already, my main job is uh, sort of to do it invisibly. Because when people come to me, they don't really think about they want to be safe and healthy in their house. They think that's going to just be assumed that I'm not going to design something that is unsafe and unhealthy. And, but that's part of the job of the architect is to know what those things are and automatically design them into the building whether it's on the Earth or whether it's on the moon. So in regard to gravity, wind, and water, we, we, with one-sixth of the Earth's gravity, you know, the original thinking is so the building structure can be lighter because it'll be carrying a sixth of the weight of a similar building on Earth, and, uh, and the astronauts are experiencing zero gravity when they're in the space station, and then the moon is, is uh, less than Earth, but uh, more than zero. So astronauts are going to experience all three environments. They're going to be on the Earth, where there's 1G. They're going to be in space, where it's 0G. And they're going to be on the moon. So they're looking at how that affects people uh, going from one environment to another. And then th I mentioned that you know we, we know, all know we have earthquakes. We don't all live in earthquake zones. But I've lived in Japan where for three years, and we probably had 100 earthquakes there that I could feel, um, none that were dangerous enough to cause destruction for in the area I was in. So I started looking into are there moon quakes or are there Mars quakes for that reason? And uh, looking at, because the, the, um, there are seismic zones on Earth that as an architect, you have to design up to certain standards in the different zones. And there's zone one through five, but zone four is like San Francisco. Um, but even around Yellowstone um, Park, Yellowstone has a super volcano um, that is under the Lake Yellowstone, and um, it is a zone four area all around that area. Um, I was When I was welcomed to Montana, a lot of people saying, oh, you're probably glad to get out of San Francisco where there's earthquakes, and I just am quiet about it, but I happen to know that there's just as much chance there's going to be an earthquake in Montana as there is in San Francisco in the next decade. The other thing is wind forces. Now, without an, an a, um, atmosphere on the moon, they're not going to have tornadoes and hurricanes. But on the Earth, we have to design, like if we design in Florida or any areas that experience tornadoes and earthquakes, we have to design for those forces. You can see how with tornadoes, no one's designing a house that can, you know, live through a tornado uh, if it actually hits the house. Um, but with hurricanes, there's special glass that you have to use. There's special windows and doors that you have to use. There's all sorts of design effects. Now, we won't have that on the moon because there's no atmosphere. Um, the same with water. There, n There's no standing water on the moon. There's frozen water underground, perhaps, and that's one of the things they're going to be looking for uh, when they go there. Um, yeah, Roy, the soil, I th that was one of the things that I experienced when I went to NASA Ames this month, is they are creating what is the equivalent of some of the area. The area they're studying now is, of, of course, near the South Pole, and it's it's almost like flour. It's it's a powder, um, but it's and it's caused by the fact that the moon is no atmosphere, it's been bombarded by meteors and meteorites for three billion years. And all of that has created um, um, a fine dust and different levels of you know sandy to aggregate to boulder sized things all over the surface. And they actually have to design the vehicles to go through 
Um, it's almost like trying to design a beach buggy uh, where you have to be going through the sand. Yeah, and, and the actual, if you look through a microscope at the, the um, pieces of what we would call sand, but um, on the moon, they're very sharp and, and angular. They're not rounded and, and eroded the way that the sand is on the Earth. And yes, Phil, they're very, very dry. And um, now micrometeorites, if they're little, they will be hitting the moon station. And so that's one of the reasons that they're looking at um, what they call, what we call dirt or earth on Earth is called regolith on the moon. And they're looking at using moon dirt to cover any structure uh, that they would build on the moon because you need six inches to a foot of that to protect you from radiation, which is a huge thing that we don't talk about much because we have atmosphere and we have the Van Allen belt and, and the, the radiation from the sun um, is uh, um, more present when you're on the surface of the moon. And that's why the astronauts have to wear suits and, and we have to protect in them in the ha any habitats we build is from just from the radiation that exists on the moon. Yeah, it can be evil to work with. That's true. Um, okay. A lot of good information um, being posted in chat. I won't try to repeat it all, but um, it, I love... Um, the groups here always have additional information to add. So the moon, the, we've only had seism we only had seismo uh, seismometers up on the moon for five years, but they recorded 12,000 earthquakes in that time, which is about 2,400 a year. There's about 20,000 earthquakes a year on Earth, but we have a much bigger planet, and some of them are very weak, but they go detect they they are detected by instruments because we have pretty sensitive instruments uh, on the earth so the construction of the buildings on the moon will have to be designed with moon quakes in mind and I've designed buildings in the San Francisco Bay Area with the seismic zone four and and Montana and so it, it does make a difference so in addition to trying to shield from radiation but not having gravity uh, or having one sixth gravity and um, and having no atmosphere, we're really going to, I have never seen, I have not yet seen any study that shows how design on the moon will take moon, uh, uh, moon quake forces into consideration yet. And I'm going to be talking to NASA next week and ask them that very question because that's something that is um, going to be very important. Because the moon quakes can last up to 20 times longer than an earthquake because the way the moon is structured its surface once it starts moving it will shake for a long period of time and that is can is is one of the most dangerous features of an earth of an earthquake on earth is if it lasts a long time it can really shake apart a building more significantly than if it's just a um, um, just a short uh, earthquake with a jolt now, someone already mentioned the moon's uh, temperatures. Um, here, look at those these ranges, and whether you go with centimeter, uh, uh, centigrade or Fahrenheit, those are low temperatures, minus one hundred and seventy three degrees centigrade, minus two hundred and seventy nine degrees Fahrenheit, is very very cold. So you can see how the, the, the habitat is going to have to be designed to keep them warm. On the other hand, the high temperatures are 127 centigrade and 260 degrees Fahrenheit. So the, the, the astronauts are really going to have to be protected from, and that's the range of the moon. It's not like every location has that significant a range, but some of them do. Um, the other thing is there's no atmosphere on the moon, so there's no humidity necessarily. And humans need to be in a, you know, not a totally humid environment, but they need to have some humidity 
So that's going to be part of the artificially mechanically designed spaces for the moon astronauts, just not in their, uh, not only in their, their suits, but also in their, um, um, in their habitat where they take their suit off and they can work. And also there's some rovers that are being designed so that the astronauts don't have to wear um, spacesuits in the, in the rover, um, and that's going to be an interesting thing as well. Yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about energy in a minute because this, that was one of the most interesting things that I came across. But let me just do, uh-oh, my chart snuck over on my text. Anyhow, but let me take you through this really quickly. There's a thing called the psychometric chart. When we were in architecture school, when I was in architecture school, it only had three components. It had temperature, humidity, um, and... Um, I'm just looking at what else it has here. Um, and and the what this is, is it, it determines what human comfort is. The latest psychometric chart has 27 different factors on it because it's really, as we study human comfort, we realize that if you're tall or if you're short or if you just came in from outside or if you've been in the room for two hours, it all affects how you respond to your environment. And we've all been in rooms where someone will come in from outside, and if it's hot outside, they'll go over and, you know, turn the air conditioning on. Or if it's cold outside, they'll come over and turn the heat up. And, and people that are in the building are already comfortable, and so it's a matter of uh, understanding the human factors that we're, what we're designing for um, uh, and uh, how that's going to uh, apply to the moon structures. The other aspect of it is the quality of the air, something that has come into human consciousness is in my lifetime, when I started designing buildings, we weren't looking at VOCs, which are uh, compounds that even furniture and carpeting can give off. And if it's significant, people can get sick in, in, in the house from the VOCs. So there's been laws passed uh, that try to eliminate the VOCs in the products that are uh, produced. Um, but there's always something. There was just a family at Thanksgiving, two um, Thanksgivings ago at Tahoe, Lake Tahoe, where 13 members of the family, they have a big ski lodge kind of house at Lake Tahoe, and some... Uh, carbon monoxide leaked into the house and all of the members of the family were unconscious when the people found them. They all lived miraculously, but even in a regular house, now this was because it had snowed a lot and a lot of the vents of the air conditioning units and the ventilation units that were designed uh, were, were blocked. But we're always looking at not just the uh, quantity of air and air circulation, but also the, the quality of the air so that people aren't affected or made sick uh, by the air. Yes. Yes, and it's interesting, Roy, you mentioned radon. I was working on an issue where, like in some areas, like in Vermont, where there's lots of stone uh, right below the st surface um, areas, you know, a lot of granite and things like that. There's, there, there are parts, uh, this happens in Montana, there's even some places in, in California where there is radon present in the ground. And radon is a form of absorbed radiation that radiates out from this ground material. But, um, and I, I came, when I came back from India and when I was doing a study there, somebody from NASA contacted me and said, I'm doing a study on astronauts and, and I understand you're doing a study on radiation as well. And I said, well, I'm not doing a study on radiation. She goes, oh, I thought you were. I thought you were looking at radon in the ground and how it affects uh, humans that build houses that have radon exposure. And I went, oh, well, what's that got to do with radiation? She said, it's the same thing. That's what, th she said, so this, the thing that we're designing for astronauts when they're in outer space and when they're on the surface of the moon and comes from the sun, the radiation 
is the same radiation that comes from the Earth in some locations that where the Earth has absorbed uh, radiation. We're just protected by the Van Allen belt and uh, on our own atmosphere from some of that. So <coughs> there's a lot of places where I have found regular Earth-based architecture and space um, exploration have uh, benefited each other from the research that is done. Yes, thank you, Sis, for clarifying that. It's not exactly the same thing. It is radiation, but there's radon gas uh, that is escaping from the Earth that is affecting our health. And um, um, the, the sim there's the, it, it's a human reaction to radiation that is the similar thing. The, the, the ways we um, experience it is different. Um, but you're absolutely right. Okay, this is something I found, and I just want everybody to think about this, and let's see what happens. NASA has made a statement regarding nuclear power, which is they are going to be developing nuclear plants for Earth-based power. And this is the first that it really came to my attention. In some, uh, some ways, I heard about it a long time ago, and I went, yeah, yeah. Now that we're really thinking about it, and there are a lot of people, we've had a lot of discussions, you know, Delia has led some of those in regard to what to do and what not to do. You know, uh, you know do we want to do open pit mining on the moon? Well, one of the questions is going to be, and, it, and NASA is acting like the question has already been answered. They are planning on having nuclear power plants on the moon. Now, they're not going to be the ones that we're thinking of, like Three Mile Island or um, the ones in, in Michigan uh, that are, have these huge steam towers. Uh, but they, it is going to be nuclear power. And so I'm not going to go on and on about that. I just want to know, I just want everybody to realize that Lockheed Martin – Westinghouse and Boeing, all three of those companies have contracts to develop nuclear power for the moon activity, and this is underway, and um, the smartest minds among us need to be contributing to, you know, how this proceeds. We talked about sourcing materials. Um, on Earth, everything is from Earth. You know, we don't go to other planets to get products that we end up using in, in our houses on, uh, on Earth. On the moon, some things may come from Earth because it's easier just to take them up there. But eventually, they're trying to figure out what can be created on the moon that is um, using local materials. And so there's a lot of research and resources that will determine what is can be made. But things like iron and nickel are up there. They could make steel, or they could even make iron that is pure enough that it would serve as steel for many uses. They may find sources of, of things that they could create oxygen and, per uh, and perhaps hydrogen gases. Um, and then we talked about the unprocessed regolith or moon soil already. Um, <laughs> Someone's recommending the cow not jump over the moon, but we take them up there to make cheese, which is a good recommendation. Now, I, I'm, I'll just go over this really quickly because um, of time. But indoor air quality, lighting is going to be a factor. Humans are affected by the lighting uh, that they're surrounded by. Noise, acoustics. You know, if there's a clanging noise that goes on all day long or if there's some mechanical equipment, the astronauts become very sensitized to noise. The comfort we talked about, the in different ways comfort is uh, created. Accessibility. Um, should should um, an astronaut become disabled, are they going to be able to get around up there? Um, not necessarily with a wheelchair, they might not need that, but um, how uh, accommodations are being made so everybody can navigate freely. Water quality, we talked about. Natural light and ventilation is another way of dealing with the lighting and, and how it affects. Um, th 
living on on the moon and having milkshakes apparently. Now there are fire safety issues, electrical safety, structural safety. Um, the, you know, when I'm designing a house, you know, slip and fall accidents are like the number one cause of, of, of human injuries in many cases. And so the, because the gravity up there is one sixth of what it is on Earth, but it's something that like we have to design for on all of our Earth, um, particularly in houses, but even in stairways of, you know, universities and things like that. We're always looking at um, things that keep people from uh, tripping and falling. Like if, you, you know, they've done studies, and if you're just an eighth of an inch off as the rise and to run of a stairway so that one stair is just a little bit lower or a little bit higher than the previous stair, someone will trip and fall. I mean, when you go up, start going upstairs, you get into this rhythm. So there's lots of things that architects know that we have to design in automatically and we don't bother our clients when we're designing a stair and you know to promote how wonderful we are that we're going to design a stair that they're not going to trip and fall and hurt themselves they're thinking of course you're going to do that I mean there are just some things that are built into the assumptions when you hire an architect for something but also water safety which we've mentioned indoor air quality and then security in other words what kind of security are, are going to have to be uh, proper for um, moon design. I think that's an interesting uh, quality. Again, here's another picture of, of NASA addressing sustainable lunar architecture and how they're keeping that in mind. And I think I, I would like everybody to feel they can contribute to what NASA is doing. It's sort of our space agency and uh, ESA and, and JAXA and all of the other space agencies, I mean, these should be getting input from uh, the population because it's, it's for everybody, and it's our tax dollars that are going to this in, in, in almost all cases. Um, but this is them uh, taking sustainability into consideration. And I, th I think in some cases people just use the word sustainable, but the, the, it, they mean different things by it, like sustainable operations with crew landing services. I, I, you know, I, I don't know what that means. They're just going to be able to sustain that service. Um, but um, I, I think our science circle has a lot that can be contributed to these programs, and I'm happy to take it to NASA myself or, or find contacts at NASA for people to communicate with for those that are interested in that. The other thing is there's been a lot of designs. The, the, there have been so many design competitions to design a moon base. I'm just going to show a couple of them because they vary. But there's no shortage of people thinking about what the moon base should look like. And it's none, it, none of these are going to be built. But it's fun to have a competition. It's fun to build something. It's fun to fantasize about what it should look like. And one of the things that we're trying to do is just gather all the scientific information we can and think about uh, working with NASA to understand, and, and the other space agencies, as I keep mentioning, um, to um, to see what eventually is going on up there. This is Artemis III's trajectory. I'm going to talk to Trixie. For people that un know who Trixie is, Trixie is an um, um, avatar in Second Life, and she's done a lot of really interesting work. But th this static presentation of the, the Artemis III landing on the moon, I find more confusing than informative. And so I'm going to talk to Trixie about if we could do one that is 3D and automated. Um, I'll, I'll have her take a look at this and see what she thinks. And then if anybody who wants to learn or sort of work on that little um, ex um, experiment and exhibit, I think will be interesting because the Earth is going around the sun. The moon is going around the Earth. 
these objects are going around the Earth and the Moon, and it's a really dynamic situation, which this, they're trying to show the dynamic situation, but it really isn't um, it happening in, in this description. I think we need a 3D, 4D, you know, over time kind of demonstration of this. And Phil, if you have any ideas, we can um, sort of put our heads together, because it would be a, a really interesting, because if you look at the, the um, orbit around the moon of the space station, it's not what we would think it would be. Yeah. Well, I'll do some thinking on that. Now, NASA, one of the things I really like about NASA's work is they throw off a lot of technology that has uses on Earth. In the early 80s, they were already working on VR headsets, data gloves, robots, um, some of the earliest work in, in that. Uh, and I was involved with some of that. And then I was involved with the funding for the NASA rover. I actually was on the team that wrote the report that got $40 million from Congress to get the NASA rover funded. And it was really interesting working with all the scientists that, who contributed to what this was going to be and then trying to describe it to Congress people who I was told have third grade to fifth grade scientific understanding and so we couldn't just describe what was going to happen. We had to figure out how to describe it in really simple terms. And it was a fun assignment. And the, the other thing was I went up to Montana for a couple of years after um, this being funded and them starting on it. And when I came back, people said, well, you know, all the work you did on the Mars rover, you know what that turned out to be, don't you? And I said, what? And they said, it was this Google self-driving car. And then all the stuff that Tess was doing and all of that, you know, is, is based on, it isn't the exact same technology, but it's based on the uh, Mars rover technology that was developed at NASA and much of it at Ames Research Center. And even in the architectural world now, we have construction robots that can go around a floor in a building and lay out the, 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 uh, the walls, and they can also put QR codes on the concrete that tell the the uh, electrical the electricians and the uh, plumbers as to where the electrical and plumbing um, hookups go. So that that's what excites me about this whole, you know, people being aware of this uh, of their tax dollars being spent on something that does have throw off a lot of technology that we can all benefit from. Now the other thing I want to leave everybody with is. We have a team that has sub-teams, uh, th and we're doing this moon science project, and we have a science education team, a construction team, a writing team, a psychology team, an ethics team, an outreach team. So please contact Science Circle if you have any interest in any of those teams. And the way we're working on it now is, is, is you can join two teams if you want to. And um, let's see. Oh, yeah, that is a good idea, Tag. The augmented reality goggles. Um, so please feel free to contact Phil or me or Chantel or um, Sumo or somebody that you feel comfortable contacting in Science Circle about your participation because there's a lot to contribute and and people have good ideas uh, from all directions. You wouldn't believe the people, the avatars we've attracted um, to work on the projects. It's really, it's really quite exciting. And quite honestly, I think this can be one of the most important projects done in Second Life. And I've been in Second Life since 2005. And... Um, it, it's a very, very exciting group of people. Science Circle is one of the best groups I've, I've found. And yes, Desmoni. Oh, could you be a little more specific when you say the debate regarding person-based and machine-based? Oh, do you mean like robots without mi people in them? Um, yeah, I, th I think the answer will be some of both. Um, there are things that the robots can do that people just can't do. 
and there are things that humans can do that robots just can't do yet. So um, um, I'm not the be-all, end-all authority on it, but I know they are working on robotic things. You know, even the rover, the rovers they develop are almost like assistants to the 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 astronauts that pilot them. They can drive them around, but the robot could have a arm on it that it can lift and pick something up, and it can have video equipment and other sensors and things like that. So it's almost like a compatible relationship between the robots and the people. It's not necessarily a competition or either or. Yeah, Brian Eno, it would be interesting to see what he comes up with for his moon music. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I, I remember that as far as people saying, why are we sending people up there? It could all be done with robots. Um, I think it's a, a good discussion. All these discussions are healthy um, and, and only contribute to the, the, uh, the benefit of the projects. So that's a really interesting point. I think someone should pick that up. What about sound on the moon? If if it doesn't carry through the atmosphere the way it does on Earth, um, and, um, and I think people are getting more comfortable with what the full range of robotics can be considered, um, and also with the the latest um, technology that's scaring people is artificial intelligence, and that's a, w a wonderful. I, I work with a lot of AI programs in different ways in text and in imagery and things like that. And I love it. I'm not terrified by it at all. And uh, it can be uh, – and I'm actually working w with one group that's going to be using it for teaching. And rather than being afraid of people cheating, you know, and using AI to write their paper or create an image, it's actually developing AI products and tools that can help teachers, like help you write a lesson plan, help you grade papers, help you – uh, give assignments to students in ways that they're using AI, but you can tell what their work is and how they're using it because it's sort of like um, using computers. I remember when computers were not allowed in my structures class because um, Marshall Purnell had his hand up all year long because he was the only one with an HP hand calculator and he could just calculate the answer faster than anyone else in the room, and it does give you an advantage. So we want students to learn things, and that's the important thing. It, you know, being afraid of cheaters is a reasonable um, concern, but it's just it is cheating, and it shouldn't be done. And so I think the the um, the groups that I'm working with that are teachers that are using AI and want to support because teachers are just overburdened with work to do. The, uh, they can use support and help, and um, th that's the thing that I think. Uh, I'm I'm aware of and focusing on that I think is a, a positive rather than a negative. Yeah, the habitats will have atmosphere in in their own conditions where the astronauts can take off their their suits and uh, they can hear music. Oh, let's look at Roy's image of daylight on the moon. Yikes. Yeah, they said the contrast is so great that if you're standing looking into a crater, the part that is in a shadow is black. There is no detail. You can't see anything. You have to have an artificial light and light up the shadow side of these craters because there's no atmosphere and the atmosphere doesn't – I mean, the atmosphere on Earth reflects light all around, and so we don't get the black blackness that the, uh, the, the astronauts are going to see on the moon. Yeah, very harsh. So please feel free. It's My time is up, and I really appreciate your um, attendance and interest. And uh, please feel free to uh, email me or contact me or ask me questions or make suggestions. 
And please think about joining a team. And most of all, think about join, joining the Science Circle. It is a great organization, and it'll be, you'll benefit from it, and you can. there's lots for you to contribute no matter what your background is. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, I think this stuff is interesting. So um, I'll probably do another one in a little while. Um, because I'm going to be uh, going to Ames Research Center and finding out what they're doing uh, with their um, regolith research. Because they may be able to build moon bricks out of the regolith or do 3D printing. That's an area that they're looking at. Thanks, Teglon. Thanks for everybody's participation. I like the participation. Take care, everybody. Have a good rest of your weekend.